<laughs> By the time you're hungry enough, you never raise your hand. Okay, so a couple of things came up in discussion that are, are probably worth mentioning. Um, I don't think I have to go back to the slide, but you remember in a very early slide, I wrote as an example of an eigenform, I equals O of I, or I am the one who says I. And it's a good linguistic example because you will have noticed by now, if you're thinking about it, that the meaning of I in the left-hand side of this statement is different from the meaning in the right-hand side, right? So it's true that at the symbolic level, you're using I and I, but, um, but even when I express it, right, if I say I am the one who says I, I'm speaking from my personal I, but by the time I got to the other one, I'm referring to the symbol I. So uh, that happens. Um, and, uh, and you could compare, uh, oh, and another one that I like along the same lines, and we might take a look at it, is um, a statement of, of who I am by Heinz von Forster, the cyberneticist. And he says, I am the observed link between myself and observing myself. And um, this is very interesting. I'll just repeat it again if you've never seen it before. Uh, it's a nice recursive statement. I am the observed link between myself and observing myself. Um, in that case, I think all the references to self are references to honest references to self and not to symbols for self. So it's uh, as a, a better form than I'm the one who says I, but I'm the one who says I is very interesting and concise. Um, the other thing that is interesting to look at is the way I constructed the square root of minus one, if I was willing to be a little more slippery about symbols and algebra, because I could have said this. I could have said, by I, I want to mean the process, plus minus, plus minus, plus minus, plus minus. But I recognize that it's a temporal process, and that in order to pin it down by, say, observing it, uh, a certain amount of time is required. And if I then did it twice, the second time I observed it, the time would have slipped along a little bit. And then the temporal operator that I put in would have happened out of the physical process of observation. So you said you, you did I, and then you did I again, and what you got were plus one the first time and minus one the second time because of the slippage in time. Of course, it didn't have to be exactly that much slippage in time, but that's what I created with the temporal operator. It slipped a little bit, and so it ended up being, um, and I ended up observing plus, and then I observed minus, and so I got minus total, right? And I, I equaled minus, not plus. It's only with the perfect synchronization in no time <coughs> that you would get plus and plus, or minus and minus. So, um, so that slippage is something that we engage in a lot when we're speaking in language certain kinds of precise or relatively precise slippages that form the meaning, uh, that are related to our ability to extract meaning in language. Um, I'm, uh, if, if, one were try to, if one were to try to formalize all of that, it would be very complicated. Um, what happened in that definition of I is that I'm taking a little bit of that and formalizing it, but it's a particular one that I wanted to do for the sake of physics eventually, but earlier had thought of doing just because it was there. Um, if it was physics, it would be the story I just told you. I'm thinking of discrete observation, and I have things that I'm observing, like position and velocity, all right? And I have a clock that's ticking, and I'm assuming that any operation that I do requires one tick of the clock if it's a, if it's a velocity measurement. And if it's a position measurement, I can do it quickly, and I don't require a tick of the clock. 
position is spatial and velocity is temporal. And now think about that for a moment. I observe the position, and then I observe the velocity. Okay. And the position is the position right now, and then I get the next position minus the previous position to get the velocity and take the difference, divide by the change in time. What if I did it in the other order? I observe the velocity. Well, okay, so I get the present position and the next position, and I divide by the time, and I get the velocity. But now, I observe position, but it's the next position. And so they don't commute with one another. And I could carry on with that and work out the commutator, and um, some physics will emerge. Um, it's, at, it's somewhere near the end of the slideshow, and I might not get to it, but, but I wanted to point out to you that that same thing could be resolved algebraically by a temporal shift operator, just like the one I made for i. i is a simple discrete process. And that's what I do, in fact, to make a, a kind of calculus of discrete measurement. And it's interesting to do that, because you see how non-commutativity comes into the elementary physics even before or to the side of quantum considerations. It's just there out of the interrelationship of time and, spa and, and space and measurement, okay? Um, we'll come, maybe we come back to that. Um, now I'm getting back to this recent work about Majorana fermions. If you had a row of n electrons, um, mathematically it looks like 2n Majorana fermions, right? Each electron is a pair of fermions, A plus IB, right? Um, and um, it would be like this. In this is what Kataev wrote down in, in this almost first paper on this kind of thing back in 2000. So he says, so I have a row of electrons, but each one is to be thought of as a pair of Majorana fermions. Um, and he wants to think about how this would behave. Um, oops, and that's all I've shown you from his paper. I'm just showing you a couple of papers. So, um, so, um, oh yes, that's right, there are two parts to this picture. So on the one hand, you may have this situation, but on the other hand, the Majorana fermions from adjacent electrons might pair with one another. And, and he suggests that that's related to, perhaps in some situations, might be related to Cooper pairs of electrons and does some analysis of how these systems would behave, hoping to use them for possibly quantum computing. Um, another paper that's very interesting, these are papers that are on the archive, you'll find them. I can put this slideshow up on, on, um, on a Dropbox and uh, give you an address for it if you're interested in getting references. Uh, this is a very nice paper, um, mostly incomprehensible to me, but, uh, but I managed to extract some things to play with from it by Ivanov, <coughs> also around 2000. And he's thinking about the braiding of the fermions. I'll talk about the braiding. Um, and then here's a, 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 a kind of recent summary of things, which I thought I would read to you so you get a little picture. This is from the wiki on Majorana fermions. So in superconducting materials, Majorana fermions <coughs> emerge as non-fundamental quasi-particles, which are more commonly referred to as Bogolyubov quasi-particles in condensed matter. And this becomes possible because a quasi-particle in a superconductor is its own anti-particle. Majorana fermions uh, are, in superconductors were observed by various experiments. Mathematically, the superconductor imposes electron hole symmetry on the quasi-particle excitations, relating the creation opera operator and energy to the annihilation operator. Majorana fermions can be bound to a defect, and then combined objects are called Majorana bond states or zero modes. Um, and, um, and you can analyze them in terms of anions, the way they will move around one another. And people have thought about building topological quantum computers based on that, a little of which I've talked to you about. Um, and, um, and then there are quantum vortices and relations with the fractional quantum Hall effect. Uh, I just mentioned this to show you that this and references to the different parts of this are not hard to find. You can just go on Google and say Majorana fermion, go to the Wikipedia, and then, and then out. And there's all sorts of things that you can look at. Um, and this is a little more 
The team from the Kavli Institute of Nanoscience at Delft in the Netherlands reported a couple of years ago an experiment involving nanowires where the, that dream of Kataev about, about getting correlations by having the, the, Fermi, the Myron fermions and adjacent electrons interacting with one another, they claim to have seen uh, some of the predictive results of that um, in their experiment. Uh, and there have been some other experiments as well. Uh, for example, these guys um, have um, used uh, scanning electron microscope uh, methods and have seen some evidence of the Myron fermions. So it's not that electrons are actually decomposed into two other particles. Probably you'll never see them come apart. But, uh, but something is going on there uh, that that little mathematical hint is, was showing us. The little hint of A plus IB. Right. Here's another example of a paper. And another diagram from a paper. Cooper Perrin, as I said. And another one. Um, so it's active. Uh, and um, I think maybe it, it's a little, it looks a little slow to me on the experimental side. And then I didn't see people reproducing the Delft experiment from my reading of the papers on the internet. But, um, but something is happening here. Um, I wanted to tell you about the mathematical side. So here is the situation. This is very pretty. Um, I take a row of Majorana fermions, right? So that just means I have Clifford algebra, right? A, a, each one squared is equal to one, and they end a commute with one another. Just that, all right? And I think of them as a little row of particles. And then you define these operators, one plus ai plus one times ai divided by root two, or one minus ai plus one times ai divided by root two. Those are inverses to one another in the algebra. And then you find that they satisfy the braiding operations. <coughs> now, I'd better give you a picture of that so you see. Um, and maybe it's on the slide. I can avoid that. Um, by, by braiding operation, by braiding equation, I mean this. You have three strands, and you twist the first two. Then you twist the second two, and then you twist the first two. And you get uh, a line which goes all the way over the top of the other two, and the other two are crossing down there. So you can take this line that's going over these and push it downward, and take that little crossing and push it upward, and it'll end up over here, which means you twist the second two, and then you twist the first two, and then you twist the second two. So that's, that's the basic, uh, that's the fundamental relation in braiding. Uh, and the, the braids form a group because if you have a if you have something like this a braid, you can take another one and put it immediately underneath it and attach the top strands of one to the bottom <coughs> strands of the other and multiply them in that way. Would a crystal lattice be your row? Of, I'm you sorry. In a crystal lattice, where you have a row of electrons that could do this? Yeah. So that's something you could look for. Oh, in a crystal lattice, you could have rows of electrons, or in, a, or in or these nanowires, they have rows of electrons. Yeah. Um, so, so you might think of this as temporal picture, or you can think of it as a spatial picture. Uh, you don't have to think of it as the world line of electrons or, or particles moving around one another. You can just think of it as a strand, and then I make braids by weaving them, just like I would with hair, right? just weaving lines together. And this is a basic relation in the, in the break group. ABA equals BAB, or sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 1 equals sigma 2, sigma 1, sigma 2. Um, and, um, uh, and the fact of the matter is that my, a, a rows of Majorana fermions produce, in a completely natural way, braiding operators. Um, the simplest instance of this is the quaternions. And I point out to you how the quaternions arise out of three, uh, out of a Clifford algebra with three, three guys, A, B, and C, three Majorana fermions. You form B, A, C, B, and A, C. And, um, 
and you get each one squares to minus one. And if you take i times j, you'll get k. If you take j times k, you get i, and if you take k times i, you get j. You take i times j times k, you get minus one. You produce the quaternions immediately out of them by taking the pair products, which are f square minus one, and putting them in the right order. Just try it for yourself. Take B A times C B. Well, A and C anti-commute, so I have to bring B past C, and that causes a sign change. And then I take B past A, and um, because it's another sign change, two sign changes, so B A C B is B B A C, but B B is one, so I get A C, which is K. So I J is K. You get the quaternions out of the uh, uh, out of the Majoranas, out of the Clifford. Of course, you can get the Clifford out of the quaternions as well. So like Peter likes to start with algebras that are fundamentally quaternion, and you can build all these other algebras out of them if you want. It's, a, it's just a choice. Um, I, like the, um, I like the Clifford ones because they're related to the discrete process and the square root of minus one in the way that I was telling you. Anyway, if you now form these three quaternion operators, 1 plus i, 1 plus j, and 1 plus k, you will find that they grade one another. They do the grading. Um, and and this is the general case. But, but then there's a, 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 a second way in which this works. Um, on the one hand, you have the row of Majorana fermions. I've got a more readable notation here. Um, and these are the braiding operators. All right, what I said before. Um, but now I'm going to let them act on the vector space whose basis is the, fer is the fermions themselves. So that's a way of talking about letting it act on the fermions themselves, the Majorana fermions. And I act by conjugation. Tau k x, tau k inverse is the way it acts. If you do that, this is perhaps Ivanov's invention. Then you find that it's very simple. Um, T applied to an X, two adjacent X and Y. T applied to an X is a Y, an X one. And T applied to the Y is minus the X. And that's the bit of braiding. And this corresponds for a pair of fermions to the well-known belt trick, which is often done uh, this way but I'm doing a belt trick where I interchange two particles. So I have, I have no twist on the string, and I interchange them without turning, and I end up with 360 degrees of twist on the string. All right? I mean, you may have done this before inadvertently if you hadn't done it consciously, right? <laughs> um, uh, so if you just have a, a belt and you just do that, you get a 360 degree twist happening. But when you just take the pure belt trick, you don't know whether that phase, if you think that the three, that twist in the belt is a phase, you don't know whether it belongs to this one or this one. It belongs to them both. It's not associated with the left one or the right one. But in this uh, algebra, a choice has been made, and one of them by the conjugation, in fact. Uh, excuse me. I chose to conjugate that way, tau k x, tau k inverse. If I'd done it the other way around, inverse x, inverse, uh, tau k, it would have chosen it the other way. There's a choice, left right choice in making that. And that choice causes one of them to get the twist and the other one doesn't get the twist. So, um, so there's a little more than just the bare topology in this. And, um, and that's the braiding. It's very simple. They interchange, and one of them gets a minus sign, and when they're farther apart, uh, they don't get it acted on at all. Now, that doesn't look like much, but it's enough, actually. Um, it's strong enough to produce uh, operators which can produce enough braiding so you can do some quantum computing. You, you have to add on a few other uh, one-dimensional operators in order to do it, but, uh, but it's very interesting and fundamental. Um, if you have a bunch of these Majorana fermions, then they give rise to this braiding. Uh, it's there. It would be there if they were there. Um, and, um, and so that's the story about the braiding. A very slim little thing, but sometimes slim little things can have a big effect. 
Is there any experimental confirmation? What? Is there any experimental confirmation for this gradient? Um, I doubt it. Um, it's been hard enough for these people to manage to just see the kind of correlation effects that they would expect. So to get to the braiding would be even harder. Uh, the same is true of what I told you about before in relation to the quantum Hall effect and those collectivities of electrons that have phases that go around in the theory. Um, again, I don't think that there's any experimental uh, confirmation in the often for either of these things. Uh, but they're there in the theory. Um, and if one could, and, and so it's very tantalizing to see whether uh, one could eventually have experiments that show them in practice. So a quantum computer would perhaps uh, show and, and that quantum computer that's based on this or the other one is obviously way off in the future. Um, but why, why do people, why, why are people interested in this? topological thing? Well, just because it's topology. You see, if something is topological, it means that if you perturb it a bit, it won't change very much within some level of perturbation. If the thing circles out a long ways around and gets a phase, or it circles nearby and gets a phase, it'll still be the same thing. So up to some perturbation, things should be the same. So one hopes that it's a guard against the problems of decoherence, but it's not clear. Um, um, except that it is clear that it's fascinating. Um, and maybe that's enough to keep one trying to do research on it. One more question. Why, why do you keep using the word quantum in this? Uh, it seems to me, why do you keep using the word quantum in this? It seems to me you're uh, studying... I don't know. It keeps creeping into my talk, doesn't it? Uh, <laughs> it, the, it the, the entities are... I mean, it's, it's really the topology of these entities, and the entities could be quantum objects, right. or could be anything. Well, well, let me say a word about that, my attitude about quantum, because I know you, you have some particular um, thoughts about quantum that may be different from mine, but, mm -hmm. but, but uh, um, my training has me describe quantum in the following way, that, um, that there's a certain framework, uh, and if I'm using that framework, then I'm looking at, at things quantum, or I'm working in a quantum way. And that framework is that I'm here in a laboratory or a real world situation, and there are some things that I can observe. And it may be that the right way to, to handle what I observe is to say, okay, I have a list of all the things that I can observe, and I will just make them the basis of a vector space, orthonormal to one another. Um, I mean, symbols for them, yes? And, um, and then I will look at physical states that are combinations of those, po of those possible observations. Uh, and, um, and then there is the model of observation, which is obviously a mathematician's construction, and it is. It's von Neumann's idea. That the, you would model observation by simply projecting out into one of those possibilities. Um, and the probability of getting that observation is the absolute square of the coefficient of the state vector. Um, and that's quantum mechanics. Um, pro physical, pro physical processes preserve the probability distribution that's given implicitly by those complex numbers. I don't know that that's exclusively. The properties you just yeah. described are, are not necessarily Well, I didn't say exclusively. exclusively. Yeah. Quantum, quantum, quantum processes are those processes which preserve that distribution. Um, well, they're classical. And who's to, say, who's to say that that model is everything? That mm -hmm. model turns out to work very well in yeah. a lot of situations. Right. But uh, and it's so simple to describe mathematically that it's hard to believe that it describes everything, right? Um, of course, we left out lots of physical considerations, energy and, uh, and so on. But I don't think there's any reason to assume that, that the quantum description is anything other than a remarkable, uh, remarkably successful uh, method of getting some results. That's my, my feeling. But I, it must be distinguished from classical somehow. Yeah. The question is how, and whether that how pertains here. I think the how is, uh, uh, is, is actually goes back to the beginning. Uh, the, the Hamiltonian conjugate variables are non-commuting in quantum mechanics. They're commuting in classical physics. Yes. So there are actually only two venues where you have this property. One is phase space, and the other is in squeeze space for waves, uh, phase and, and amplitude. Everything yeah. else is non 
quantum. The polarization, for example, in electrodynamics was uh, actually worked out by Stokes, what, 70, 80 years before we have any quantum mechanics. So we can't start using experiments in, with polarization to plumb quantum effects. Well, it's a very nice seductive situation, right? Because you know, you know uh, and have evolved procedures for rewriting every single classical thing in terms yeah. of a quantum so operator. You, that's and you know, how to, you know how to do these translations. Mm -hmm. and, and you get good results out of all of this. Well, uh, and it's very difficult to find any other way to get those good results. So, yeah. We well, should talk well, some more outside yeah, okay. of this. But I, think they, I think Stokes got good results. Well, I keep using the word quantum. When I do use the word quantum, that's the sense in which I'm I think you're restricting yourself. It's, yeah. This is the topology of, of these objects, and the objects have certain properties which are shared by some classical objects yeah. that are not in phase space or not in squeeze space. It's much more general than quantum. Quantum right. is a very but, small... But as he was saying, the question is, he said, well, has anybody observed these Bradings? Yeah. All right, well, that's the real question, right? Uh -huh. How could you observe the Bradings? That's a real question, um, yeah. Right. I don't know about that. That a real question, yeah. right? How could you observe that Brading? Yeah. Um, probably at the present time, observing that Brading with, would it, With microscopic would involve, objects, it might be. It would involve inventing or discovering new experimental techniques and thinking in the quantum way because that's if you, want, we have if you want to observe it with microscopic objects maybe but maybe you can take a string like you just did and something totally uh -huh. microscopic and illustrate the same thing yeah yeah because it's, it's, it's a topological thing and you were just right. pointing out that topology is not yeah. metrically dependent uh, yeah, yeah. So I, we, we'll talk some yeah, more okay. um, yeah. let, let me go on here so so now <coughs> I want to talk about the Dirac equation now um, and show some things. So uh, I'm going to proceed in a more or less classical way, but you'll see that I will end up tunneling my way over to Peter. Um, you'll see. So let's start with e squared equals p squared plus m squared, where I choose my speed of light equal to 1 and so on. Um, and, um, and remind ourselves that uh, you can get a square root of that, a la Dirac. I mean, I'm going to be in one dimension of space and one dimension of time uh, for a long time. Um, and um, so I'll choose alpha and beta uh, to form that little Clifford algebra we were working with before. Alpha squared equals beta squared equals one, and alpha beta plus beta alpha equals zero. And then e squared, if I were to write it formally like that, will be equal to p squared plus m squared. Um, so that's Dirac's idea. Um, and then if you combine that with, uh, pardon the phrase, quantum mechanics, uh, we associate, is that point here? No, it disappears on there. Um, we associate with the energy um, operator I d by dt, and uh, with the momentum, the operator minus I d by dx. Remember, I, I set all my physical constants equal to 1. Um, so, the, so then energy equals alpha p plus beta m becomes i d psi dt equals minus i alpha d psi dx plus beta m psi. That's the Dirac equation in 1, 1. And the Dirac operator is this guy here. Um, uh, because I put it all on one side of the equation. I just put it all equal to 0. Okay, so that became plus. This became minus, and there's the Dirac equation. Okay, um, and then here is a uh, plane wave to test with, and I apply only the plane wave, and I don't get zero. I get I pull down the e, I pull down a minus alpha g and a minus beta n. I, I you probably shouldn't worry about the signs too much. Um, I sometimes get them wrong also. Um, times the plane wave. So let's call that delta. Now, suppose you multiply delta by beta alpha. And then it turns into beta alpha e plus beta p plus alpha m. Um, and if you call that u, you will notice that its square is now equal to 0. Well, we arrived at a no problem. Because you see, beta alpha squared is minus 1. That's our construction for minus 1, for square minus 1. Beta squared is 1, alpha squared is 1. 
Um, so I will get minus e squared, p squared, m squared, and the end I commute with one another across between them, and so the cross terms all go away. So there's an info. Okay? Um, so, um, so that means that O psi is delta psi, and if I multiply by beta alpha, I get O of beta alpha delta beta alpha psi brings one more delta down, and I get u squared, and it's equal to zero. So you see, if I take psi equal to beta alpha u or, um, uh, times e di of px minus ct, that will be a solution to the Dirac equation. So, um, so, uh, so that suggests that, um, excuse me, I just repeated it here, but uh, it suggests that if I rewrite the Dirac operator by multiplying it by beta alpha, then I will have d psi equals u psi, and that means that um, the, the, that u psi is a solution to the Dirac equation. The Dirac operator, the new one, creates the solution, and then the solution proceed, and then proceeds to uh, make it the solution. So we have this: that b of u times the plane wave is u squared is equal to zero, and so u itself is the is the guts of the of the solution of this solution to the Dirac equation, and that's um, essentially the same as. Peter's no potent solution. All I've done is tell the story where I start with the usual Dirac equation and walk my way over to uh, his formulation. And if you would like to re-put re it in terms of quaternions, it will be easy for you to do that. I've left it in my no potent uh, but Clifford algebra form. So, um, so it, uh, the, I found this intriguing to do because then I can sit with a physics book and, uh, and look at the way they do the Dirac equation and, and make a comparison. Uh, and, uh, and then, what can we do with this? Well, I'm interested in, um, in thinking, as Peter pointed out in his book, that you could think of the U uh, as various things. You can think of it as the fermion, but you can also think of it as the fermion operator. I mean, it's a spin operator that we've manufactured this way, but why not think of it as the fermion operator that uh, corresponds to the one that we were imagining from quantum field theory at the very beginning, right? The one that was square zero and its conjugate was square zero and it had the right commutation relation and all that. Well, in that case, we need to decide what's the conjugate operator. And one way to decide on a conjugate operator, and I think there's more than one that you can play with, would be to reverse the time, all right? So that would be the time-reversed particle or the anti-particle. So I put a plus in here, and I apply d to that, and um, see what I get, and I get u, what I'll call u conjugate. Well, what did I do? I changed the sign on e. That's all I did. I left p and m alone and changed the sign on e. So um, I wonder if I um, uh, wrote this. This slide. Uh, but, uh, but you will find then that u squared and u, u dagger squared are both zero, and that there's commu the anti commutation relation in this case, it's unnormalized, but it gives you 4e squared. So we're getting a nice picture of the, of, the, of the fermion operator situation coming directly out of the Dirac equation. Okay? Um, and um, Let's take this further and find the Majorana operators and see what happens. So, um, so how do I find the Majorana operators? Well, I want A and B such that U is A plus I, oh, I see, I, sorry, because it came out square, I could have made a better slide, but let me say what I'm after. Um, Here we have u and we have u dagger. So we're looking for a and b, so that u is a plus i b, and uh, u dagger is a minus i b. So of course, uh, that says that a is equal to u plus u dagger divided by 2, and then b is equal to u minus u dagger divided by 2i. So I can always get these guys from these guys, and, and it's easy enough to see that these then satisfy up to a constant or something, the, um, the Clifford algebra that I wanted. That's just going back and forth between them. The correct commutation relation here 
here's the Clifford algebra over here. So, um, so if we had um, the U that you're looking at, um, so, yeah. right. so alpha beta E plus beta P minus alpha M. The U was alpha beta E plus beta P minus alpha M. And the U dagger was in fact minus beta, was in fact, oh, it was beta. <coughs> That's what happened when I reverse the time. So you see what happens if I take u plus u dagger, then the e's cancel out, and I collect up the p's together, and I get beta p minus alpha m. That's what I get. And if I take the other one, I get u minus u dagger divided by 2i, um, then, um, uh, then this cancels, and I get, um, I get, um, I get beta alpha e over i. And that's a nice combination because it will square to one as it should. But you see what happened is that, um, that when you form the, the Majorana operators out of this, one of them um, one of them picked up P and M, and the other one picked up E. Right? Um, and and if we had if we had um, if we had uh, decided instead of taking uh, the reversal of time, if we had decided to take the reversal of um, of space, then this one would have gotten a minus sign, and we would have picked up um, something different. We would have gotten a different combination uh, than the one that I showed you. So, um, so I thought I made a slide of it. I did, right. So for time reversal, one operator had an E and the other one had P and M. For, uh, for spin reversal, for space direction reversal, I would get P and the E and M together. And, in, and if I reverse them both, then I would get E and P together and M separately. Curious, but I get three. I get different Majorana decompositions depending on what conjugate I have in mind, um, which indicates that the decomposition into the Majorana operators is not uh, is is at the very least dependent on some extra structure in physics. It isn't just somehow uh, God given one way to do it and only one way to do it. And also, it would have to be. Well, I don't know what else to say, but that's, that's what I get out of this, and I thought it was interesting to report on this to you. So, whoops, um, that, um, that we, can, um, we can look at the, at the fermion operators that come naturally out of the Dirac equation via the nilpotent construction, and then look at the decomposition into Clifford algebra or Majorana operators that come from it, um, and you get a kind of nice answer. Um, and can you do something with that physically? I don't know. But that's the answer. Um, OK. Um, if you write in full Dirac algebra, you, um, you end up um, turning the, uh, the momentum operator into three variables, of course. And then you need to dot in that, to, take, to take those with coefficients in some other algebra. And Peter would take the dual uh, the dual quaternion algebra, and here I'm being completely classical, so I just take the Pauli algebra, but I assume that it commutes with the other algebra that I wrote. Um, and, um, and then you can do everything that I did before and uh, write it out. Um, but now comes another thing that's interesting to look at, and uh, that'll be the end of this part of the discussion. The other thing that's interesting to look at is what Majorana himself did. Majorana himself, I didn't tell you about that. He wrote this nice paper. Uh, um, you can get it on the web, in fact. I wrote it back in the 1930s, but a, it's not hard to find it. 
Um, he thought, well, I'm looking for particles that are their own antiparticles. So, why don't I rewrite the Dirac equation in such a way that, it has, that it's entirely real and the complex numbers have been abolished? Could I do that? Well, I have these Dirac matrices to play with, and they have eyes in them. And if I could combine them in the right way, then the eyes could all disappear, and I would have this matrix differential equation that didn't have any eyes in it. And that would be a real Dirac equation. And um, I'll think about it. And, and that's what he did in his paper. Uh, and if you were to say it in this Clifford algebra way, it, it amounts to this. Um, that um, you have the three directions of momentum here. Um, and, um, and you have two copies of this little Clifford algebra, right? Um, which I will call epsilon and eta, one of them, and the other one epsilon hat and eta hat. Sorry, that's unreadable notation. But, um, but then you need a bit of Clifford algebra multiplying everybody, and I have slipped the I all, all the way across the equation <coughs> now, uh, and, and, and uh, written out what amounts to the Dirac equation, the standard one. Only you'll notice that this is a product of two matrices, um, uh, which have no eyes in them, and uh, so is this, and, that, and so is this, and so is that. And they all have the right uh, anti-commuting properties to be a, a set of matrices for the Dirac equation. I've written it in this, con this condensed way, but the thing about it is that it isn't just one algebra outside of the other algebra in the momentum part. And I don't know how to do it that way. It might be you could. Um, the way Peter uh, 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 was writing the Dirac equation and the way I indicated just a moment ago to write the Dirac equation in the usual form, you, you have one algebra that commutes with the other algebra and it's entirely working in the dx, dy, dz. And then you have the other algebra on the outside. So they're nicely split apart from one another. Here they're mixed up with one another. Um, and if you're trying to solve the crossword puzzle of making this work and be real, um, you seem to run into the problem that you can't do that. You have to let them mix. Uh, and that's interesting. And I bring it up because uh, I would like to discuss with Peter and anybody else who's interested in this um, whether or not it's forced that way and what it would mean in Peter's cosmology for the algebras to mix that way. It's not against his cosmology. It's just something that maybe has to happen. Um, I won't bother you with checking that this is indeed the Dirac equation uh, because this is very technical detail to play around with this a little bit. But, um, but that's the story about that. And um, also, the other thing that I keep trying to do but I'm not sure I succeed is I would like to keep thinking of these as processes going back to the iterates at the beginning and think of these as discrete processes mixed with continuous differentiations. But um, I'm not sure that's the right thing to do at this point. Um, 10 minutes if you want. We are, we are now almost done. Well, let, me, uh, let me bring it to a conclusion in a certain way. Uh, first of all, you can think of Feynman's checkerboard for a few more fermions. And the usual Feynman checkerboard has this as the Dirac equation written in light cone coordinates and it has the I. And then these paths in the Feynman checkerboard, which form the propagator for the Dirac equation, are sums over, over paths with one I, with I to the number of corners in the path. Um, and that's where the I happens in the usual Dirac equation when you're in one plus one. But there's another solution uh, to the Dirac equation in one plus one, which is the real one. So here's a real solution, uh, a real, the real differential equation. Uh, in the simplest possible form. So this is the simplest Majorana form. That's amusing. Uh, and that means that, um, excuse me, that means that we would have, I thought I had a picture of paths. No, because it's the same paths, paths in the, in the light cone, uh, uh, any in light cone coordinates. Um, and, you, um, and you just sum to minus one to the number of corners instead of i to the number of corners. And you get the Dirac equation, and that's a, an example of um, honest, real Dirac equation. Um, so it may be possible to extend that notion into um, 
three dimensions, or, or two plus one dimensions. Um, and then a wider and uh, more uh, general view, getting back to the beginning about distinction, is certainly this, that the universal equation should be about the state of the universe. And an operator should act on the universe to produce nothing. But the universe is both an operator and a something that is operated upon. So we should take the universe to be the operator, and then you get the universal Newtonian equation, u squared is equal to zero, uh, which the Dirac equation is uh, one of the first special cases. But while that sounds like nonsense, it isn't quite nonsense, right? Because it's, it, it is going back to this situation where there is some distinction that is going to be made that creates a reality, creates a universe, creates a distinction, and that distinction, in a certain sense, out of its very nature, produces this no potency. So the no potency that we're seeing happening, like by a very, by, seemingly by a trick, when you when you watched it happen with the Dirac equation, starting from the usual situation, is really not a trick. Um, it's really fundamental, and I think that Peter's right in bringing it forth as the fundamental thing, and that the other kind of picture of Dirac that I was drawing is somehow secondary. We should tell the story in that way, which it does. Um, and of course, another simple example is just Spencer Brown's mark itself as the operator, which will give you the simplest no potent that I know. And that again is not quite nonsense. That's going back to what are the properties of awareness distinction happening right now. It's a no potent operator. So in this formalism, the mark makes the distinction. We've said this before. Um, and the physical theory could be, I should say, seen to write itself in terms of the condition for observation to occur at all. Ideally, that's the way you want the physical theory to appear like that. Your future plans. What do you advise your children and grandchildren? Well, I'm not. I'm not uh, professionally a physicist, so uh, so I work on topological problems for the most part with graduate students. And occasionally, if someone comes along who's interested in physics, and I talk to them. But, uh, but I, I'm not trying to. I, I'm not. I'm not in the perhaps more dangerous position of a physicist who, who is sending people out uh, with epistemologies that don't coincide with the rest of their, uh, with the rest of their community. But that's a problem, is it not? I mean, you might, you might say, I, I agree with this kind of, kind of thinking, but then what should I tell students? Because after all, they have to have careers. I, I, I mean, I think it's worth discussing because um, what that says is somehow, if this, if we believe that these points of view and not just mine, other points of view that come up here are fundamental, um, uh, but we worry that they will wreck people's careers, then somehow you have to stop worrying and really believe in your ideas. Don't you? Yeah, I know. Again, I'd like to thank you. This is the Everything is signed. We think it's signed. Okay, the signs are but no triadic, irreversibly triadic. The, the object, the sign refers to determines sign. Sign determines interpreter, which is, I think, model. In such a way that the model is con oh, of course, corresponding to the object. So my so you're saying there should be a corrupt interlock between sign, symbol, and interpreter. Yes. Yes. They right. three forms now, they have it. As as first would have said. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now and, and, and indeed it must be so, but how often do we think about it when we're either doing pure mathematic problem or, or some physical I think problem. unless we do that, we cannot communicate. So yeah. that's there. Yeah. It's, it, it's in us. Now, so my question is this. Just as you have done, the, the, the uh, zero topology theory is a model of reality. Just you've, uh, you, you can describe elegantly the reality in terms of zero totality formalism. 
why can two e this uh, replace zero with infinity? Infinite possibility. Why can't we explain zero with infinity? Yes. Why can't we explain reality in terms of uh, infinite set of possibilities? Put it back in my now you say zero. But we don't know what the reality is. There's an infinite well, number well, of zero. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, I know the answer to this. There's an infinite number yeah, of zeros. Exactly. So that's really what it's about. It's about zero repeating itself infinitely. That's a possibility. Yeah, no, that's what it is about. The infinite possibility will include that possibility too. I won't disagree with that. Yeah. So, so my the impression is that, that I think there are many ways of describing reality. Zero totality is one, but there are yeah, okay. other okay. ways. So we can, well, we can notice this. There, there, may, there may be many ways of describing reality, but what physicists are engaged in are, are, um, are describing and creating eigenforms that interlock in a repeatable right. way. Yes. And it's entirely possible that the whole enterprise is just designed to work, and that it doesn't describe any reality at all. Well, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> I think reality, it unless it's a reality it has, it is grounded in reality, I don't, reality. Back, so I don't think you will yeah. see such a consistent yeah. regularity. Because you, the, the reality may be rational and regular. The, the, the point is that it is science, right? I mean, you, you go out there and you discover things like electromagnetism or other phenomena. I know you never would have imagined them. You didn't make them up out of, out of just your, out of just applying some some idea to itself again and again. Those uh, haven't been eliminated. But then, in order in order to work with it, you then are in this arena of uh, repeatability and eigenform and, and getting everything to fit. Um, and so you're constrained in that because because that's the only way you know how to proceed. Yeah, I use the the, the, the cookie cutter cookie cutter paradigm is a mundane <laughs> expression, but you know there are so many different cookie cutters. If you use certain cookie cutters, you are adapting a certain framework within which you can strain to. Well, this isn't what's happening. This is saying this is what we're faced with. As Lou says, we found electromagnetism. Oh, yeah. Nothing we can do about it. We didn't say we wanted electromagnetic, that's what we've got. And he's saying that's the same with this. This is what we've got, and this is what we've got to put up with. That's a, that's a one way, sure. That's an important yeah. aspect of reality. You, you, you might say it would be nice if it was like this, but it can well isn't. And you've got to do what it is like. I'm sorry, but can we have another question? We, we can discuss that. I, I think you have to make a connection to the physical world. The, the ordinary number system, now that's very useful because it just counts things and, and you find things in nature that you can count. And, and so that has a direct connection in a way. It's, it's, it's our way of handling the, the, the model. Yeah, sure. And, and now you've got this quantum energy, but you've got to find connections to the real world. I don't think that you've shown that. Well, well no, I, well, well, what, I, it wasn't my purpose to show any new connections to the real world, but I told, you about, but I told you about some that are in the offing, right? I mean, let's take the Dirac's equation. Dirac does a mathematical thing. He says, well, this stuff, you can I can take a formal square root of, uh, of the energy uh, by using a Clifford algebra, and I could write an equation. I did it nice. Hi. And uh, that would be very pretty. You're on camera. Oh, good, good, good. Thank you. you. Describe things. So I think that is a good Now, I'm not, I'm not walking in here and showing you something brand new in physics. What would be nice? Something brand new in physics that that uh, that would uh, that comes from mathematics that would uh, be like the Dirac equation. I'm, I'm actually just reformulating things you already know. Um, and and I told you a story about how people are finding some uh, this this little bit of mathematics about the myelin fermion is very suggestive, and people are following it out, and maybe they're going to find out that that actually indicates that there really are phenomena there, right? Um, um, the other things that I'm saying are almost tautological, I believe. There's, I'm saying that there's a structure 
to the way we observe and distinguish that is interwoven with our physics and our mathematics, and we should pay attention to it. And I've articulated some aspects of that in relation to some known physics and some known mathematics. So, so, um, so I, I can't, I don't think I can fault myself, except it would be better if I could come forth and come to you and say, and here is the uh, replacement for the Dirac equation or something, but I, I, I don't have. So, okay, thanks.